Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. It's actually fear of sex. Uh, my name is Bob and I am alcoholic. And I'm sober today only through the grace of a God that I was afraid to believe in, that I've accessed and maintained in my life through the 12 steps in the big book, good sponsorship, and a consistent and persistent commitment to the primary purpose of helping other drunks. And because of that, I haven't had a drink or any mind or emotion altering substance since October 31st, 1978. And uh, that's... That's a miracle. I, I, was, I didn't know what I was talking about till I got here. And uh, not that I ever really know, but I was looking at the topic, and at, at first I was a little stumped. I thought, why would they, how am I supposed to talk? What, what's this about? And then, then the wisdom of the committee sort of hit me that of all the speakers here, that they would pick me to talk about why we are here, that I could actually insightfully speak for the whole fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and, and do it very well, I suppose. Uh, uh, and then I came to my senses and I better not do that. Uh, but why am I here? How did I get here? And how do I stay here? I think that's a... I don't know, the two questions, probably how do I stay here now that I'm here is probably the most important question. Uh, I want you to know something that I went to great lengths not to come here, not to end up in AA. I did not want to be an alcoholic. I would rather I would rather be a mental health case than an alcoholic. I'd rather be a drug addict. At least there were rock stars that were drug addicts. I mean, there's a little panache in that. I'd rather be just about anything than an alcoholic. And it, it talks about that in our book when it says that Across the board, most of us have been unwilling to admit we were real alcoholics. And yet, I don't want to be this person that I am. And after several treatment centers, because I, I am just not easily convinced of something I don't want to be convinced of, I eventually was intellectually bludgeoned into an acceptance of, oh my God, I got that thing they're talking about. You know, when I start, I can't stop. Uh, and I, you, how do you learn that if you're like me and you don't want to, you don't want that to be true? You learn it by failure, by trying one more time and failing and one more time and failing to control and enjoy my drinking. As the book refers to as our, our, illusion that we pursue to the gates of insanity or death and boy I didn't want to be an alcoholic and then I was intellectually bludgeoned I got it okay after several treatment centers all right and several, and many failures at trying to keep this thing in line I, I realized I'm the guy who can't take the first drink or anything else that will light me up like that sets me off like that I can't take the first drink no matter what um, for me, as an alcoholic, to take a drink of alcohol is like having sex with a gorilla. You ain't done till the gorilla's done. <laughs> you can tell yourself all night long, me and the gorilla are just going to have a dance. No, you're not. No, no, no. It's going to be bad. And, and I get that. And, and, and with that knowledge, I kind of think I've arrived somewhere. I kind of feel like I'm out of the woods. It, it, there's a, a great line that talks in the book about self-knowledge. And I've always secretly been deluded to thinking that knowledge is power. That if I know, I'll change. If I, if I get it, if information, knowledge, that knowledge is not power, uh, there is one who has all power. And if there's one who has all power, there ain't no power in knowledge. There's an illusion sometimes that there is. And I sure had the illusion. I, I thought that I was out of the woods. I thought, oh, my God, I get it. And now I'm just really seriously, not like a couple times I kind of said to myself I was never going to touch it again, but this time really seriously 
I'm not going to pick up that first drink, and, I, and I'm, I think I'm out of the woods and I'm good to go. And then something started happening to me that was, that was hideous, uh, something that I couldn't get my mind around, something I didn't know what was wrong with me, that I would swear to myself that I'm never going to touch that stuff again, and eight, ten months later, I'm back at it. And it didn't make any sense to me. I, I mean, because I don't consider myself stupid. And, and I don't consider myself weak-willed. My God, I've, I've had some ex, ex, exhibitions of willpower that when you look at them objectively were staggering. I mean, I, I, mean, I think we, we do some things that normal people just couldn't have the willpower to do. I mean, how many of us will, will drink, will go to an after-hours club drink till 5 a.m. and then have to be at work at 7 a.m. and be at work because you've got to have the paycheck to keep the medicine flow. I mean, we'll, you go to a PTA meeting, ask how many people would sign up for that and puke in as a regular way of life. You're not going to get a lot of takers for this. I mean, they may try it for a day or two, but they, don't, they can't hang with this kind of stuff. I mean, we persist. We persist to the gates of insanity or death. It's just I couldn't seem to persist when it came to staying sober for some reason. I, I couldn't understand. I, I'd eventually get to that place where I'd just be so worn out emotionally in this abstinence thing. I, I don't know what's wrong with me. There'd be this awful kind of loneliness that would just seem to seep into me after a while and and all the shine would eventually wear off of how I'm going to do this and I'm going to go to college and I'm going to turn over a new leaf and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to still be me. And that ain't no good. Because I'm the guy that don't fit anywhere when I'm sober. Uh, I'm the guy that's something wrong with me and I can't tell you what it is. And, and by the time... Guys like me get to that place, uh, and I'm sure I'm not alone in this. By the time most of you have gotten to Alcoholics Anonymous, I assume if you're like me, there has been some people getting in your face to talk to you about you. I mean, maybe your mother and father have been talking to you about you. Maybe your minister or priest has had a talk with you about you. Maybe your psychiatrist or psychologist or doctor has talked to you about you. Maybe your boss. Maybe your PO. Maybe your wife or your husband or your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Maybe, maybe even tragically your kids have come and talked to you about you. If you get really bad, maybe your, maybe your drug dealer has been even talking to you about you. I mean, you know, if you get really bad, I mean... Uh, uh, it gets, gets real bad. Maybe strangers on the street are stopping you and talking to you about you. And they all say the same thing. I mean, it's different words, you know. They, but it's, it's all the same, really. It's, it's Bob. Bob you, Bob, you are so screwed up. And you catch me on a low day when I'm not defended, I'll probably hang my head and go, yeah, I know. And then they hit you with it. They always they use different words. They always say the same thing, though. Do you know why you're screwed up? No, I don't know. I don't know. Well, you're screwed up because you keep getting screwed up. If you'd stop getting screwed up, you wouldn't be so screwed up. And I'm pretty screwed up, so I think, okay, I ain't going to get screwed up. And when I don't get screwed up, I get so screwed up, i got to go get screwed up. <laughs> and then I end up somewhere and somebody's saying, do you know you're screwed up? And I go, yeah, I know. And they say, do you know why you're screwed up? Because I, uh, I keep getting screwed up. I don't know if this doesn't make any sense to me. Because I can't see past alcohol being an answer. I can't connect the dots to that's the problem. I don't understand what's happening to me. I don't understand that I, I, that I have so much more than an alcohol problem here. I have a condition of mind and spirit and emotion that when I, when I stop drinking, I'm everything that it talks about in that book. I am restless. I'm irritable. I'm discontent. I don't fit anywhere. I, I suffer from depression and anxiety to the point of, 
of, of it's just overwhelming to the point where I go drink again at times over it. I, I, I can't hold a job anywhere. I, and I'm a hard worker. But I don't know what's wrong with me. I'll, go, I'll get a good job. And I'm not very, I, and with seemingly good people, and I'm not there very long before they're idiots. And, and, and I must be some kind of carrier or something. I don't know, but I, every place I ever work, they end up being idiots. And, and I can't seem to hook up with anybody, and I don't know what's wrong with me. And I, I sought, uh, I sought help a lot. I, I sought help in, uh, a lot of in the psychiatric field. My mother was a, a, a therapist. My mother worked for mental health and mental retardation. And uh, she uh, was a brilliant lady. And, and uh, she got her between her and my dad, who was uh, very politically connected, got me in to see some amazing psychiatrists. I mean, very, very cool people. I still carry around stuff that I learned from some of them that has served me. It just never seemed to do anything for the thing that was really wrong with me even though I carry some of that around today and it's very useful that it never seemed to touch what was wrong with me. I uh, made some efforts at church. I, uh, I, don't, I know the people in church say I'm forgiven, but I sit there and I don't really feel it. You know, I, <laughs> I, I, don't, um, I don't fit there very well. Unless I'm drinking, then I want to lead them all in hymns. Um, I, I try a lot of stuff and nothing seems to work and I, I really I, I came to believe in something that it talks about in the book That, and I think the only way a guy like me could ever ever get there is to exhaust everything that could possibly show up on the radar to fix yourself. I mean exhaust it. And then it says in our book, it says we came to believe in the hopelessness and futility of our life as we'd been living it. And I came to believe that uh, before I ever believed that AA had anything for me before I ever believed that there was a God that could help a guy like me, before I ever believed in anything, I believed in that from, from seven years of relapsing, from seven years of uh, trying desperately to do one of two things and failing painfully in both arenas. And the one was to try to jumpstart the party, to get back to the good old days when the magic was in the medicine. And I can't get it back. And I can't control and enjoy it. And I failed and failed and failed. And the other thing is, is to control and enjoy my abstinence. Because I understood something. I knew this. I knew that if I could get myself in such a state that I was okay, sober, and I didn't feel like I was doing time, and I didn't feel like I was the guy who doesn't fit anywhere, if I could change some, do something to change me into the guy that was okay, sober that I'd probably be able to stay sober and have a normal life. But I couldn't do it. And I tried everything, everything there was, and exhausted everything. And in 1978, I uh, came to in a park on the north side of Pittsburgh. I'd been thrown out of a place called the Ark House, which is pretty hard to get thrown out of, actually. You have to actually be drunk and obnoxious in the place to get thrown out. It's it was the bottom of the food chain for retreatment in that part of the country at that time. And I'm in the park, and I'm, uh, i got two years prison coming at me quick here. It's just a matter of time till they pick me up. There's nobody in my life to turn to. There's no, my parents want anything to do with me, and, and, uh, and I feel so horrible. I, I feel horrible when I'm drinking and I feel horrible when I'm sober. And, I mean, the sober is a little bit better for a while, you know, but really it ends up feeling like I'm doing time. 
And I am stuck. And I don't know what's wrong with me. And this doctor had given me a complete physical workup in a, is a, in a detox that past year. And he came to me after this workup, and they did everything from kidney, the dye and the kidney scan to liver panels, everything. And he, he said that uh, I was young enough, I was in my 20s, that young enough and uh, bounced back enough easily that I could probably physically go on like I was going on for another five years or more before it killed me. I remember sitting in the park thinking, five more years of this? Oh my God, I couldn't imagine five more days of this. I can't, I, I am stuck in the trap that it talks about in a vision for you where we eventually get to a place we can't imagine life with it anymore because it's, it's, I've exhausted it. There is no party here. It's, my drinking's become pathetic. I drink and I cry and I sigh. I feel sorry for myself and full of self pity and loneliness. And, and I get sober and that ain't much better. And I can't imagine life with it, and I can't imagine life without it. And the book says we'll be at the jumping off place. We'll wish for the end. And, and so I, I, I got up and I went to a, got some, tried to get some wine for fortification and courage and went to a bridge because I'm just going to make this stop. I'm, and I was very, I was very uh, blessed that day that my, my fear, not, not my fear of dying. I'm not afraid of dying at this point. What I'm afraid of is on that bridge is that maybe I won't die. Maybe with my luck and my track record, I'm going to end up paralyzed from the neck down in some charity ward for 50 years as members of AA parade their newcomers through the hospital room. And I get to hear them say things like, this is what happens to you when you don't find God and work our beautiful 12 steps. And I'm paralyzed. I can't even give them the one finger salute. You know, I'm just stuck there listening to my head tell me what a piece of crap I am for another 50 years. And that terrifies me. I'm not afraid of dying. Uh, if I knew if there would have been a guarantee that I stepped off that bridge, I'd be just like that. I think I'd have done it. But I'm afraid of, of screwing it up. And I, I think most of us aren't afraid of dying, really. I mean, not really. I mean, I mean you could threaten us to keep doing this. It's going to kill you. Yeah, by Wednesday. <laughs> You want to scare me. You want to terrify me. You're going to feel like you're feeling for another five years. You want to scare the crap out of me. And, uh, you, you know, we try to drink. I think a lot of us, try, especially if you get into the phase of alcoholism, the last phase where you become the, the chronic oblivion drinker, as I was at the end, where I just drink for oblivion. There's no more party here. I drink... My idea of a, of, a, of a successful day is to come to, drink quickly till I pass out, come to, drink quickly till I pass out, and just keep doing that. Uh, that's, that's, my, that's how I roll. This is not a party. This is pathetic. Uh, uh, and I, I've tried to drink myself to death, as a lot of us do. But you can't. It takes too long. It's like being kicked to death by rabbits. It just goes on and on and on. No wonder some of us are trying to kill ourselves. It's like, stop. Uh, and so I, I come into Al Alcoholics Anonymous the last time, and I, I was after this failed suicide attempt. And I, I think I understood something in an unconscious level that I couldn't have put into words. And, and out of this, I had some hope in AA. The first, and I think every one of us has to do two things, to, it seems like, from talking to people. One is we have to make that connection of identification where you're sitting somewhere and maybe you're being 12-stepped by a couple old-timers 
Or maybe you're sitting in a meeting in a detox or the county jail or just newcomers in your home group and, and some guy is sharing and, and you have that experience of sitting there as, as I did in the detox the last time where you sit there and you find yourself nodding your head thinking, oh my God, I'm like that. And you start out of the lonely abyss that is alcoholism. It's like a, it's like a thin thread that connects to something. And I... Uh, I started to identify with these people. And then the other thing, and this was what it says in that part of the book, and, and there is a solution, is not only do we have to come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of my life as I've been living it, it says we had seen that it really worked in others. And I was sitting in this, uh, host, this detox, and uh, a man that would become my sponsor and other members of Alcoholics Anonymous brought meetings in there twice a week, as I do to a, a detox in Las Vegas twice a week now for three decades or more. And they would bring their meetings in there and they would just fish, just fish, hoping to get a nibble from a guy like me. And um, I watched them. You never know. You, you, you're the only example of the big book people will ever, ever see. And I, I think that it is my job to try to uh, fit myself to be a maximum service here so that I can be a, a, a light of attraction. Not so I'll be better or rise above, but I will be more useful. And these guys were useful. And they were useful because... AA worked in their lives. I watched them. They laughed a lot. Some of the stuff, I don't know what's funny about it, but they laughed a lot. And they goofed on each other as they were coming in in the meetings. They'd stand outside the meeting hall and in the meeting before it started, and they'd be j- go joking with each other and carrying on and picking on each other. And I noticed, I, I'm, a, I'm a noticer, I noticed that they, they were dressed very well. Uh, and, and they were out in the parking lot. There was a couple new Cadillacs from these guys. And they were doing pretty well. And then I listened to their stories. And they, they'd they been homeless guys at one time. They'd been bums. They'd been guys who'd lost everything. But probably more important than anything, as I watched them and I watched the laughter, I started to realize something. I started to realize that these guys really appear to be having a better time sober than I had when alcohol really worked. And man, I wanted that. And I dared, dared to hope that if I asked these guys for help and did everything that they told me to do and followed them around and threw myself obsessively into this thing called Alcoholics Anonymous, that just maybe, maybe what happened for them could happen to me. And I guess inside myself, I got to that place of commitment. You you know, I was a relapse for seven years. It, ta- it tells my story in one sentence in, in, in working with, in how it works. It says, those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. And I didn't know it. Nobody ever told me that I was part of that group. You know, I get sober. I, I, I so, my, my friend Bob talks about it. He, I don't want to change. I don't want to surrender completely to this simple program. I want some relief. I want relief. And so I'm a relief junkie. I'm an ease and comfort junkie. I get sober and I just start targeting things that look like they're going to make me feel better, that look like they're going to give me some relief. And it'll be, oh, that girl or that job or a motorcycle or a guitar, getting that band. All You know, I just start targeting stuff. And, and if you're like me, it's, it's always the same thing. You know, you bring this stuff into your life with an excitement. Because this is the deal, man. This is, look at this. This is the deal. This is the nicest girl I've ever had been with in my life. This is the best job I've ever had in my life. And then in no time at all, the shine wears off of it. And it really, it, isn't it odd that I end up hating things 
and people that I thought were going to make a difference. Because when it lets me down, I just don't walk away and go into something else. I kind of resent it now. It, it aggravates me. I'll go around talking bad about that company that didn't light me up the way I thought it was. And what am I doing? I, I just secretly, unconsciously, on an emotional level, comparing what it feels like to have that job in that steel mill to what it felt like to do four shots of tequila when four shots of tequila was fantastic. Now I don't like that job. Matter of fact, I'm, I'm pissed at the job. Or I'll compare what it feels like to be in this relationship to what it felt like to drink a pint of 151 rum. Now, now, I'm, now she's aggravating me. Right? I don't even know I'm doing that. There's so much of alcoholism that occurs in this, in this, in this, un, un, oh, this dark area that I'm not awake to. And sometimes, sometimes in hindsight, just by watching the cause and effect and, and opening your eyes and working with others and you see it in them and then you start to connect the dots to you and you go, oh my God, I, I can see what was going on now with me. I work with a lot of new people. I've learned more about me working with them than I could ever learn about me through years of intensive self-examination. I've always been able to see me better in you than I could ever see me in me. And, I've, and not from a lack of looking. I, I've, I don't know about you guys, when I'm in a bad spot, sober, I'll just sit down and think. I'm a thinker. I'm a thinker. I'll just, I'm a ponderer. I'm, I, just, I just get mentally, just finger the, all the little nuances in my life and the emotions and and trying to figure out and examine what the problem is. And I can never see with any clarity what the problem is, because what I'm looking for, I'm looking with. And I can't see that. I don't know what's wrong with me. And after this uh, failed suicide attempt, I, I, the book says... Uh, you see that it worked in others and came to believe in the hopelessness and futility of our life as we've been living it. It says there's, there's, not, there's nothing left now, is there, Bob? There's nothing left. There's nothing left. You've tried it all, haven't you? You've primal screamed. You've been hypnotized. You've been medicated. You've been churched. You've been dunked. You've been sprinkled. You've been... You've been Reparent. You've done everything that's come up on the radar, and you're still you. You've changed towns. You've found wonderful people to love you. You've, you've been given opportunities, and you're still you, aren't you? There's nothing left except to pick up the simple kit of spiritual tools that you guys were laying at my feet. You, you had been laying them at my feet for years and I jump over them on my way to get what inside me I think I need. Because I'm the guy, I'm not looking for a change, I'm looking for relief. And Chuck Chamberlain used to, I, Chuck, when I heard Chuck say this, it just about knocked me off my chair. He said, if you be alcoholic, and he was talking about when, when we get sober and all the things we do. He says, if you're alcoholic, eventually you'll get to a point where you can no longer put anything between you and you. And there you are. And that is really pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. I'm stuck being me. It is what it is to be in the bondage of self. And I'm shackled to my own obsessive focus on myself. And I can't change it. I can't wish it away. I mean, I, I, I don't suspect I'm much different than a lot of us. You know, you come here and after, because we're not quick to see things we don't want to see, but eventually you, you kind of, the, the veil lifts and you go, oh my God, I'm self-centered. <laughs> now the whole world's known that, right? I'm, the whole, every, matter of fact, they, my, I, as a little kid, my mother used to say to me, Rob, you're full of yourself. It just I don't know what she's talking about. It's like I'm I'm sober a little while. It's like oh my god I'm self-centered. Well, glad I know that. <laughs> just not going to be that way anymore. Oh. 
and I can't change me. And not from a lack of trying. My God, if I could change me, if any human power could change me, I'd have been changed. I'd have been changed. But I'm stuck. I'm stuck in me. And I can't get out of me. And I don't know what's wrong with me. There was a time, there was a time when five shots of tequila would get me out of me. It would relieve me of the bondage of self. It would set me free. And and God, what an amazing, amazing spiritual effect alcohol had on me at one time. I mean, it was, I I mean, there. I understand now why some of the great monks would drink wine and feel close to God. I mean, I get that. I mean, you know, you never get lit up and you just feel like you're just one with the universe. I I remember one night saying to a bunch of guys, we were smoking reefer and drinking wine. It was about three in the morning. I said, we're talking about this deep stuff, deep, deep stuff. I mean, I said, they said, this guy said, this is what Buddha saw. You know, you know what I mean? It's like it, it, I feel spiritual. I'm, I'm like I'm me and God are like. Matter of fact, I am God actually. I, I, but a humble, benevolent version. I mean, you know. I'm, uh, <laughs> Boy, if alcohol would have continued to do that, I'd have never got sober. I don't wouldn't have cared. I had to go to jail periodically. Little price to pay for that effect. Oh, little price to pay. But it stopped working. And in 1978, I'm at, the, I'm at that jumping off place and I, I get this guy to sponsor me. And I said something to him. Did you ever, did you ever have the experience in AA of saying words and you don't really know that you've meant them? And then after you say them, And you're thinking about what you just said. You'd kind of like to take it back. And I said to this guy, I'll do anything you ask me to do. Well, uh, you see that the old timers in AA, oh, they got like lists of stuff. Just they're just waiting to lay on you. I mean, uh, there was all kinds of stuff. I had to go, oh, a meeting habit and a God habit. And I, I don't even believe in God. And they got me on my knees praying in the morning and at night, which is seemed like I felt like a hypocrite. Should, shouldn't I wait till I believe in God first? And they said, I feel like a hypocrite. You've been a hypocrite all your life. What's the difference? Just do this. <laughs> they wanted me to start doing 12-step work when I was new. I mean, 12-step, I, I thought, this, uh, this is not good. I'm not ready yet. I, I told this guy, I said, don't you think I should work on me for a while? He said, work on you? You've done quite enough of that. Stop it. <laughs> And, and he was, I didn't argue, I couldn't argue with that. I mean, I had worked a lot on me. I mean, I was, I mean, I am all I think about. I mean, I just, you know, I, I, I just get me, I, I plaster me on the windshield of, the, of my own car as I'm driving through life, just wonder, as I'm wrecking into things, because I can't see past me when I'm wrecking the car. But I, it's all I look, look at is me and my emotions and my future and my past and, and all I'm ever trying to do as a victim of this delusion that I can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if I only manage well. I've been working on me. Trust me, I've been working on me. I've worn myself out working on me. And, and AA doesn't make sense. It's, it's like... They're asking me to leave all that stuff alone. We're going to kind of give it to God. Yeah, right. (laughs) And we're going to go and make these amends, and you're going to start paying these people back and contact the courts, and you're going to make it right to your parents, which was hopeless. It's not going to work, and I just do it. And they had me taking these crazy actions and and a lot of 12-step work. And um, Bob, Bob says something. I heard him say this years ago, and it is so right on the money that uh, Alcoholics Anonymous in and of itself, the book, the steps, the meetings, none of it really changes us. But it, it seems to our actions seem to keep us in, a, in, a, in the zip code where change can occur. 
And a lot of it has to do with making things right with you. And as I get, as, as I make things right with you, what happens is they, I start inadvertently becoming right with myself. And I never expected that, that cause and effect. I wanted to make it right with me and still think you're a bunch of jerks and not have to pay you back. I mean, but as I made it right with you, I started to get right with me. And, and then as I did that and made that the focus of my life, plus this dedication to the primary purpose. And every single day they had me doing something. Every single day. Some kind of service or 12-step work. And, I, and what would happen is that long periods of time would go by where I realized that I hadn't really been giving my life the proper attention that it needed. And in my absence, it, it seemed to get better. <laughs> Which is kind of offensive, actually. Uh, and, and I didn't know that you guys were pulling me away from the problem, which is me. And allowing, because in my absence, I'm out of the way. Now, because I'm doing all this 12-step work, there's no longer too much of me between me and God. And God's starting to work in my life. This, none of this makes any sense if you're new. And why would a guy like me do any of this? And why would I continue to do it? And, and that's, the big, that's the big piece of business in my life, is not to change the game plan. Not to delude myself. I have this ego that clamors at me. And it wants me to diminish my involvement in this thing that has saved my life and given me the only good life I've ever had. It just clamors. It's, it's seductive. It's seductive. And, and not to... I, I don't want to be the guy that's 40 years sober or 32 and a half years sober and looks back at those those years and realizes that I'm doing I'm half as much involved in the actions of recovery as I was when I was five years sober, because then I'm really making a statement to myself and the rest of the world that you know for the most part, except for this little thing I do, I've kind of gotten over this thing. I haven't. I haven't. I got two guys right now in my life that at one time uh, were stellar members of AA. And then with close to 20 years of sobriety, uh, they returned to drinking. And they didn't stop being stellar members of AA overnight. It was an incremental compromise. Slowly, slowly, slowly. And what, what, how's that happening? The same way it happens in me, I suppose, is that the clamoring of self. As I, as I start moving AA out, I start moving me in. And then the primary purpose is not helping you, helping other alcoholics and doing God's will. Primary purpose becomes me. Becomes me again. And, and, and that's such a seductive road. Because as, as I move into me in a life of self-serving, there's a lot of excitement in that. Especially when you're getting your own way. I mean, it's very cool. But there's... There's no difference in that road than, I, you know, I change the road signs and think I'm on a different road. This, I've been on this road before. Just because I, I, I snuck out and changed the road signs doesn't mean it's not the same road. It's the same road. It's the same bumps. It's the same everything. It's the same going off into the distance and leaving everything that had been home. I, I, I walked in here a few minutes before the meeting started and I started looking around and I got this amazing feeling. I, I, there's a lot of people in this room that I really love. There's a lot of people in this room uh, that I've looked up to over the years. There's a lot of people in this room that have said things that have become a part of my life. There's people in this room, sponsees and grand sponsees, that have been, that at times, and they don't even know it, they've relieved me of the bondage of self and God's work through them. And I was sitting here and I was looking around and there's an awful lot of people in here I know. 
And I was the guy that was dying of loneliness. I was the guy that just absolutely, when alcohol stopped working and being a social lubricant for me, absolutely could not connect with anybody. And when I stood on that bridge in 1978, if if you would have asked me at that moment as I'm trying to get up enough courage to jump, what's killing me, I don't believe I would have said alcoholism. I think I would have said I felt like I was dying of loneliness because I'm so lonely drunk and I'm so lonely sober and I feel lost here. And no matter what I do, I can't seem to make any kind of connections with anybody anywhere. And I didn't know what was wrong with me. I didn't know that it was a spiritual malady called alcoholism. I didn't know that when I get sober, my spirit just seems to get even more withdrawn and disconnected from life. When I get sober, what happens is my very spirit gets depressed because I'm put, it's like it's being smothered by me. I put my whole life and my emotions and, and my future and my past into this giant pillow. And when I quit drinking, I just hold it on my face. And I start smothering myself with myself. That's why we all, we have, we all have this common experience. You, you, you do abstinence without recovery and change for about 10 months. And you take a drink. What's the first thing we all do? We all go, oh, somebody turned the air back on. That's just my spirit starting to get unencumbered by me. See, I get me on me. I can't get me off of me. I can't will it off. I can't distract it off for very long. When I stop drinking, it's like, it's like that creature in that movie Alien that attaches itself to your face. It's just like, I'm right here on me. And I can't get me off of me. And there was a time when four or five shots of tequila and I'd just fall off of me and I'd be free. And my problem really becomes the condition of my spirit once I stop drinking. I have done nothing, nothing in 32 plus years uh, to address alcohol. Nothing. Matter of fact, I can't tell you one action I have taken that has been anti-picking up, fighting where I fought the bottle. I have not fought the bottle in all these years. But I know about fighting the bottle. I know. I fought the bottle. I can't tell you how many times I, I, I would make up my mind and swear to myself. And when I got sober in 78, I heard a guy say in a meeting the funniest thing I ever heard. And I, it was so right for me. He, he, said, he said, I quit drinking over 50 times. And then he said, every time I quit drinking, I got drunker in hell. He said, that quitting drinking was killing me. (laughs) And isn't it odd that we come here and we have a problem with alcohol, but it's almost like I don't, that's not, the answer is not found within the problem. And I come here and I start fighting in a different arena. I I, I do, I make a lot of effort in, in doing something, but it's not in battling alcohol. It's as I every day look for the resurgence of my ego and self and it, it it's every day it's there it comes back it comes back so quick and the greatest trick it, it's ever pulled is to convince me it's not there it's not ego when you're right is it I'm not playing God if if you really are out of line and need straighten it out I mean that's not playing God is it uh and I don't even know I do that sometimes. I, it just slips in and I, 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 I'm entrenched in a, in, a, in a two-fold accountability. Actually, probably more than that. But uh, one, I have a sponsor and a couple guys. I have a group of guys that are sober a long time and they have complete license with me and they take it. 
to tell me when I'm getting full of myself. And, and I do on a regular basis get, so, get, get that deal going again. And then even probably more importantly, I have a whole bunch of guys over here that I sponsor. Some of them, I always seem to try to have one or two brand new guys in my life. I need that. Uh, I, I'm the guy in the book where it says we have a seeming inability to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering, humiliation of even a week or month ago. But when I'm sitting with a guy that's three weeks out of detox and he's depressed and his life's in He's burned it to the ground and it's a mess. Through him, I will be able to bring into my consciousness the memory of the suffering, humiliation, which alone in my blessed life, I could not achieve that, that connection with me. And I connect with me, which is through him. Through him. And then the guys I sponsor, uh, they, they, they turned to me. I, don't, I didn't want this. I didn't sign up for it. I, I just started sponsoring people when I was new because I was told to do it. And I just, I didn't want to do it. I didn't think I was, I, th- I thought maybe I should wait a couple years. And they said, no, you just do it. Bill Wilson didn't wait a couple years. You don't wait a couple years. Just start doing it. And, and what has happened over the years is that, I find I found myself, and this didn't happen overnight. I was sober a long time before I woke up to this. That I am the primary example of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and how to conduct your life sober in AA that these guys will ever see. And when I started to wait, when the veil of, of me and my crap lifted enough for me to see that, all of a sudden, I, I saw some things in my life that I was doing that I was, I was ashamed of. It's, it's funny how I will think it's okay for me to do that, but I don't want anybody else to. You know, I'm, a, I'm one of the kind of guys that I think the 55 mile an hour speed limit's a really good idea. I mean, without it, there'd be chaos on the highways, but I'm in a hurry today. <laughs> you know, I, like I'm above the rules, you know, like it doesn't apply to me. And when you wake up to seeing that you're the example, and, and you'll see it because what will happen if you're like me is that if you're a, if you're a, a point or a, a, a person of disharmony and disunity in Alcoholics Anonymous, your sponsees will start to copy some of that behavior. And I, I found myself many years sober in a situation where I saw guys doing some things and I realized they were doing it because I did it. And it... it, it it gave me greater motivation to, to come to God and, and really seriously ask Him to change me in step six and seven than I ever could have had any other way, I think. And the end result is that uh, is freedom. Why are we here? I know why I'm here and why I will come here again tomorrow. And the next day, I go to a lot of meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I do. A, I'm involved here because I seek something that I desperately, desperately need that I only seem to be able to get intermittently because it, it fades so quickly. And that is freedom. Freedom from what? From the bondage of self. Everything I do in Alcoholics Anonymous is to that end. It's, it's, it's amazing how in God's world, how their problems seem to exist that don't really exist. And if you take your hands off your life and leave it alone and go help someone, how much of that stuff is self-correcting? Uh, how I, I have hurt myself in sobriety trying to fix myself in sobriety. I've hurt myself financially when things come up on the radar and I just have to get proactive and, and, and I make it worse. And I make it worse. I just went through a thing uh, where I, I, was, uh, I was scared. Um, and like every time I've been scared in my, in my whole sobriety, it's, it's based on things that are delusionary. It's imagined. 
But it doesn't look that way when you're in the middle of it, I'm telling you. I can see the end coming at me. I mean, I can see the end coming at me. And, well, let's wait and see. So I didn't take any action. I, talk, I, I, got, I, I tightened up the, my leash to the old timers in AA. And I started having lunch with guys like Dick T two, three times a week and talking to uh, Clancy more often and, and, and spending time with some of these guys it, because I needed the reassurance that everything is in, in God's world is, is perfectly in place as it should be. And I, and I got to watch the situation correct itself. And I didn't have to do anything. And looking back, I could have really hurt myself in that situation if I would have reacted to my fear. And I guess, um, I guess that I don't have any better ability today in managing my own life than I did when I walked in the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. But my ego has gotten smarter. It's gotten a lot smarter. It's trickier. It uses passages out of the book. It'll use the traditions. It'll use whatever it has to use. Um, but you guys have saved me from me. And I and I bank my life on it. I just want to make it, I just want to make and keep Alcoholics Anonymous the center of my life. And I believe and bet my life that if I do that, that all will be well. That God will take good care of me. He has. I told him in a prayer about ten years ago. I said, all right, I know. I'm supposed to really try to be more serious about this decision in step three. And All right, I'm going to be a little more diligent about trying to let you run the show and hands off and let you run my life. But if it doesn't turn out well, I'm going to tell everybody. (laughs) Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.